We're continuing tonight on this grand theme of the appearance of our Lord, the second appearance of our Lord. The last time we met, we dealt with the body of Christ being complete when Jesus comes. And all of the saints would be gathered from the four corners of the earth and the four winds of heaven. <laughs> that's, that's wherever they are, they're all going to be gathered into one place. What a picture that's going to be. And then the purpose for the earth, which one of the grand purposes is that the angelic hosts, referred to as principalities and powers, in Ephesians 3.10, God is showing his manifold or diverse wisdom mm -hmm. to these principalities and powers through the church. So that grand demonstration, that, uh, that class will be over, and it will be a new mode of learning after that. Yeah. Now what I want to establish tonight may seem rather rudimentary, but uh, when Jesus comes again, when he appears, mm -hmm. all means of grace and agencies of salvation will be terminated. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the point that I want to that I want to establish tonight. <clears throat> Whatever means are designed to rescue people from <coughs> sin and deliver them, they will be obviated when Jesus comes again. Whatever means are intended to uh, equip us for battle and to equip us to resist the devil and resist temptation, whatever is required to press forward through the obstacles, that will all be removed. Whatever presumes resistance, whatever kind of supply, grace, provision, utility, whatever presumes an enemy, whatever presumes a weakness, whatever presumes a goal or a liability or a state of imperfection will be obsolete. That, that's what I want to establish here tonight. <clears throat> now for right now, there are certain means, divinely appointed means that are required for us to have moral and spiritual perfection. Moral perfection refers to the ability to choose the good and refuse the evil. That's, that's what you call moral perfection. It's, it's, you're in an arena where there's right and wrong and competing forces, evil and good. So there's certain things that God gives us that are adapted for that kind of circumstance. You're combating evil. You're combating wickedness. wickedness. You have a foe. Mm -hmm. There's a wall between you and the goal. There's waters you have to go through. There's fires that you have to step through. and So there's certain things that God has provided in salvation that are adapted for that kind of situation. There is, for instance, in the while we're in the world here, there's a need for expectancy. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that you, you don't have it yet. There's something coming yes. that's not here yet. For instance, when the Lord described the kingdom of God like a, like a man who dis, went on a far journey and distributed some, some pounds to his servants, <coughs> in Luke 19, 13, he said the kingdom of God is like this. He distributed these pounds and he said to them, Occupy till I come. Mm -hmm. Now there's grace for occupying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, that means that these, these, these things that God gives you can get away from you. Mm -hmm. They can be taken from you. You can neglect them. And so there's things given to occupy. Again, this spirit of expectancy. I'm, I'm just pointing out here that, that salvation is adapted now. While you're in this world, salvation gives you things that you, that you need to occupy and, be, and, be, and expect good things to come and work with that in mind. 1 mm -hmm. Peter 1.13 Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind mm -hmm. be sober and hope to the end mm -hmm. to the end mm -hmm. for the grace that shall be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ see? well see that's you, no one's going to say that after Jesus comes again right. there, there's not going to be any angelic 
Gird up the loins of your mind and hope to the end. This is the only world you're going to hear that. Amen. After this world passes away, they'll never again be said. Because the enemies will all be vanquished. There won't be any obstacles. Again, 2 Timothy 4.8 Wherefore there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge shall give to me in that day and not to me only but to all of them that love his appearing. And as they lived with this in mind. He wasn't here and they lived with anticipation when he would be here. Well see that condition is not going to exist anymore. Philippians 3.20 For our conversation or citizenship or manner of life is in heaven from whence we also look, it's us expectancy, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, while as long as we're in the body, we've got to have this look, mm -hmm. posture. But when Jesus comes again, that's obsolete. Yeah. Instantly obsolete. Whoever wasn't looking in this world will not be able to ever look. Whoever was looking will never again have a distance between them and Christ. <laughs> never be. And while, while we're in this world, there's a need to form a godly character. Now this is something that's not exactly prominent in the religion of our day. The necessity for forming a godly character. Now in Christ Jesus, God gives you a new man that's righteous. I understand that. But he gives you certain graces and tools, and you've got to shape a holy life. And no, none of us can get away from this. There's no easy way to do this. There really isn't. People who want easy kind of solutions and instant, there's no easy way to be holy. You're going to have to apply yourself to be holy. And there's certain things, great, I'm calling them graces or provisions, that are designed to help you do this. Now here, let me, let me give some of the statements of the, of the necessity of this. Colossians 3, 5. Mortify therefore your members mm -hmm. that are upon the earth. If you wonder what they are, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, your members. Mm -hmm. Now they're the natural part of you, but they are there. Your job, mortify means put them to death. When they, when they say, give me some attention, kill them. Mm -hmm. Take the sword of the Spirit and kill them. <laughs> there's, there's grace to do this now. This, you, take away, you take away this day of salvation, this abundant grace, and this becomes an impossible, impossible task. That's right. But in Christ it is not impossible. It is <laughs> necessary. Anything, anything that's essential in the kingdom of God can't be impossible. Amen. 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 The very fact that it's essential, the very fact that God says you've got to do this means He's given you the resources to do it. Now what I'm saying is they're all going to be withdrawn when Jesus comes again because there's going to be no further need for this. 1 Thessalonians 2.12 That you would walk worthy of God who has called you unto His kingdom and glory. Worthy. Again, I, uh, I don't want to be come off negative on this, as men would say. But there are some people that live at such a distance from God that when a crisis comes, they can't shout loud enough to get it to God. Mm -hmm. They're too far off. Too far off. So believe me, it, there's a song that says it pays to serve Jesus. This is one of the big dividends it pays. When you're worthy of God, His ears open. Mm -hmm. And his eyes are upon you. Walk worthy of God. Here's another one. 1 Thessalonians 4 3. For this is the will of God. If you want to use the colloquialisms of the day, this is the will of God for you. Mm -hmm. Even your sanctification, <coughs> you should abstain from fornication. Mm -hmm. Now, that, no matter how decadent the age is in which we live, that has got to be done. Amen. If you're lot living in Sodom, you better be righteous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
You can't say, well, it's too hard to live in Sodom. That man vexed his righteous soul every day. That's how. This is an everyday thing. And there's grace to do this. If all of a sudden we had about several of our young ladies that became expectant, we wouldn't ask them for an explanation. And we would admonish them beforehand, keep yourself clean. Right. You do that. Whatever it takes to do it, do it. Mm -hmm. If it means you got to dress different, dress different. Mm -hmm. If it means you got to change your friends, change your friends. Mm -hmm. And if it looks like it's too hard, salvation brings what you need to get that done. That's, right. Man. That's all going to be withdrawn. When Jesus comes again, that project, that part of the thing is over. That, that part of salvation is over. 2 Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are His. Well, let's turn the coin over and see the other side now. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Here's some things. They won't leave you. You've got to leave them. That's right. And salvation is adapted to, to do that. Again, 1 Peter 1.14, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. See, there's a sense in which you're shaping yourself. There's a sense in which this is true. Now, you're not using your own tools. <laughs> huh? You have a heavenly toolbox that gives you provisions to shape and fashion your life so that it's not shameful when you stand before God. That it's like a testimony to His grace. See? Mm -hmm. you, it's like the angels will say, Oh, they obviously used the tools that God gave them. Look at them there, what they did. In that evil world, they, well, how'd they do that? They used the tools. Mm -hmm. Well, the toolbox is going to be recalled when Jesus comes again. Mm -hmm. If a person's not holy then, they're never going to be holy. One more, First Peter 1.15 but as he which has called you is holy, be ye also holy in all manner. Amen. All manner of conversation in life. Be holy in what you look at. Be holy in what you say. Be holy in what you do. Be holy in where you go. Be holy in the friends you make. Be holy in the books you read. Be all manner. Be holy. How can I do that? Well, that's what salvation is calculated to do. That's what Jesus in you will do. That's what the Holy Spirit unquenched will do. Now, as you can see, when Jesus comes again, there's no, <laughs> there's no, no further need for that type of work. Because then he that's holy is going to be holy still. And he that's unholy is going to be unholy still. That's how it's going to be when the Lord comes again. Now also in this matter, the scriptures play a very essential role. People who are ignorant of the scripture can't be very holy. They can't make very good choices. They're limited, see, because a lot of this, the scriptures are the vehicle. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture, all of it, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that... The man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished under every good work. Which means the purpose is to get you where God can use you. We understand that God can use Balaam's ass, but this is not the standard. And so he gives you the scripture, all scripture, can help you prepare yourself to be used for noble uses by God. See? Now, he made Pharaoh for ignoble uses. Mm -hmm. But that's not why he made you in Christ. He made you for noble uses. And so he says, here's the scripture, all of it, I gave it all. Every word, every jot, every... No, Jesus talking about scripture, talking about jots and tittles. That's a dotted I and a cross T. So God, God gave all this. 
and is able to assist us in this project. John 6, 63, Jesus said, The words I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. That is, they can, they can make alive the part that's dead. They can make sensitive the part that's insensitive. His word can penetrate into the depths of the heart and discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. Mm -hmm. So I hear the relevance of the word of God in this work of making ourselves holy. John 8, 31, you shall, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. See, this, that's not going to be said after Jesus comes. Jesus isn't going to step out and say, if you continue in my word, you'll be my disciples. Because all of the hindrance is going to be gone. <laughs> huh? The enemy, his head's going to be bruised. He's going to be under our feet. There's not, not going to be any obstacle. What I'm pointing out is when Jesus appears again, there's going to be no further need for these graces. Amen. There's going to be a lot of scripture that's going to instantly be obsolete. Mm -hmm. I understand that God's word will never pass away, but it's going to have a different cast to it. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be like it was here. Acts 20, 32. I commend you to the word, to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. Romans 4. 15.4, whatsoever things are written aforetime are written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. 1 Corinthians 10.11, all these things happen unto them for our examples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. 1 Peter 2.2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sins of milk of the world that you may grow Thereby, none of those statements will apply to those who are in glory. Amen. Those kind of admonitions are not given now to the spirits of just men made perfect. Mm -hmm. No one's admonishing Abraham to do this. Because all of these texts presume enemy territory, obstacle, handicap of flesh. All that's gone when Jesus comes again. Amen. And again, there's words that Scripture addresses to sinners. Certain things it says to awaken them. For instance, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. To you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in them that believe, because our testimony was believed among you in that day. And no one's going to say that to you after you see Jesus in glory. No one's going to say, now rest with us, pretty soon your enemies will be subdued. When Jesus comes, the enemies will be subdued. So this, this is obsolete at that time. Again, Luke 12, 39. This know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched, mm -hmm. not suffered his house to be broken up. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour that ye think not. See, that's... <laughs> No one's going to say that to you when you're ever with the Lord. Yeah. That's going to be taken away. Until this time, there's means to get to, for people to be ready and prepared when the Lord comes. You see, these texts are addressed to people that kind of slough <laughs> off. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord's not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness. Mm -hmm. But His long-suffering toward us not willing that any should perish, as any of us mm -hmm. should perish, but, but should all come to repentance. Next verse. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements melt with fervent heat, so forth. <clears throat> now, here's how, here's how we're to interpret 
that, well, why is the Lord tarrying so long? Because this has bothered some people. Where is his coming? See, you say, well, <clears throat> there's some repenting that needs to be done before he comes. Mm -hmm. That's what this text is saying. He's not saying the he wants the Zulu to repent, yeah. although although he does. Understand? I'm not saying he doesn't. The meaning of this text is it's his people. Mm -hmm. He wants sin out of their life. Yes. And salvation is calculated to assist them to get this job done. When the Lord comes again. That there's no further need for that type of thing. All the means, my, my uh, postulate is this, that all the means of becoming holy, being saved, they're all going to be withdrawn when Christ comes because no one, no one's going to be extracted from the fire after that. Amen. That's it. When that which is perfect has come, that which is in part, which is what we have now, shall be done away. Now what we have in part, it's complete so far as what we need now is concerned. Right. But there's more to come on the other side. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now while we're in this state of imperfection, charged with the responsibility to be perfect, even as He is perfect, <clears throat> we're charged with, uh, He says, uh, run the race with patience. See, so there's grace to do for running. We're charged fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. So there's grace to do this, see. He said we wrestle against principalities and powers. Yeah, but you're not going to do that after Jesus comes again. They're going to be wrestling with principalities and powers. Mm -hmm. We're going to beat them with a rod of iron down into subjection. That's what he said. So I'll make you over the nations. You'll beat them down with a rod of iron. You're not going to need grace to run or grace to fight or grace to lay hold on eternal life. That's done when we're in glory. Praise God. Mm -hmm. On to higher and better things. No one in the glory. You'll never hear a trumpeter say, Dude, listen, quench not the spirit. You're not going to hear that kind of thing on the other side. That's, right. That's done. Grace which means there's grace to quench not the Spirit mm -hmm. and not to grieve Him. Well, I glory in these things. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. See, you'll never... <laughs> this isn't going to be after Jesus comes again. All of this may seem very apparent, but... Well, it's, uh, you don't want to just assume, assume these things. And the, the sealing ordinances. That's my own term. The sealing ordinances. That is the ordinances that in which God confers to you the awareness of what's really happened in, the, in redemption. Those are, as we know them, are all going to be done. For instance, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. There's not going to be any baptizing on the other side. Right. That's for this side. Mm -hmm. When Jesus comes again, that remark is withdrawn. No further need for that. No one in glory is going to say, repent and be baptized. Every one of you. Yes, that's done. Mm -hmm. Withdrawn. person was baptized on this side. There's going to be any on the other. Right. Or arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. How about the Lord's Supper? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say we're not going to have something of this order, but it's going to be different than it is here. Because yeah. here we partake of, we show forth the Lord's death Till he comes. Well, when he comes, we're not going to be showing it forth in the sense we do now. It'll be, a, it, it'll be another sense, something different. And again, faithfulness. It will not be a. It will not be a requirement because that's just what we'll do. See, here faithfulness is a requirement because there's competing forces drawing us to be unfaithful. Right. But this is not going to be experienced right. in the world to come at all. It's going to be in a different order. And again, here we're told, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And if you feel as though it's too challenging, he says, it's God that works in you. Right. To will and do of his own good pleasure. Well, see, that's adapted for this world and this time when Jesus comes again. That's all completed. That's withdrawn. Or laying hold on eternal life. Or 
How about apprehending that for which I have been apprehended? What about that? That's not going to, see, that's adapted for this world here. When Jesus comes again, the sealing ordinances and all the commandments, and we know them, they're going, they're going to be obsolete. They're going to be overshadowed with a greater glory. Amen. There's going to be another kind of association that we have with the Lord. <clears throat> now, I mention these things because they're... There is a strain of theology that is built on a text in Revelation 14, 6. The text says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Mm -hmm. The priest to them that dwell upon the earth and to every nation, kindred and tongue and people. Now even though this text is in a book that is called a vision, and concerning which there is considerable that is not quite as clear as some people would make it, there's a theology based on this verse that says, After Jesus comes again, and he will in the flesh be in the world, and men in the world, in the flesh, will have access to the glorified Christ. This is the principle I've taught. That at that time there will be another gospel that will be developed and taught. It won't be the one that we've been told. There'll be another one. I thought not to do this, but to some it's, it's such an absurdity. I, I'm going to just give three short quotes here of men that teach this. Their names are Brooks, Bickersteth, and McNeil. Now you probably never heard of these men, but these have considerable influence in the religious world. Now, the, what I'm going to read here, uh, this isn't real long, is saying that after Jesus comes again, it's going to be obvious we're going to have to have another kind of gospel. It's going to be another kind of gospel. It's going to be preached by which people will be saved that weren't saved before Jesus came. And now, that's the doctrine. Here's what uh, Mr. Brooks said. Startling then, as it may appear to some, Yet I apprehend it will be found that the Holy Scriptures would, for the most part, be rendered inapplicable to the then existing circumstances of men in the flesh, and that they would need some further revelation of God. <coughs> now I think it must be allowed that a state of things which supersedes a portion of divine revelation hitherto enjoyed, and introduces men into a state of things which is the consummation of that revealed, has one grand characteristic of a new dispensation. Now what he's saying is there's going to be a new age of flesh and blood with a new message that's never been delivered before. That's what he's saying, what he teach. Here's a man in Bickerstaff. Here are, there are some original and valuable remarks on the millennium in the essays of Reverend H. Woodward. He shows how inapplicable the scriptures of the New Testament written for a tempted and suffering church are as to the state of things as after Jesus comes. Now he's right. He's right in what he says here. And this draws an argument from the personal advent of the Lord on earth to open the very fountain from which the scriptures themselves have flowed, from which new streams may issue forth to water a renovated world and make glad the city of God. We may expect during the millennium further means of grace and a visible economy possible of oral revelation from those who reign upon the earth as we saw in the Jewish economy. So after Jesus comes again, there's going to be, the, the church is going to be like a, in flesh and blood, now you talk about flesh and blood. And they're going to dominate like Israel dominated with a new, new gospel, new message. One more, and this I can't hardly handle these things, but this is uh, one more. This is Dr. McNeil. It's obvious that in the passage from our present state to a state of universal holiness, that's in the flesh, he's talking about in the flesh. Universal holiness, these characteristic sayings of the New Testament must cease to have any application and become obsolete. Not to say false. And again I say who is determined at what point of progress they cease to apply. 
We maintain, therefore, that as the statutes of the book of Leviticus continued binding until another plain and direct communication from God, who gave them, showed that they were superseded and a better order of things introduced, so these scriptures, apostles' doctrine, gospel, and a better order, so these scriptures, direct describing the experience, number, and character of the Lord's people under a new dispensation, must continue inapplicable. It's this. Till another plain and direct communication from him who gave them shall show that they are superseded and a still better order of things introduced. So, the doctrine, and uh, it is quite prevalent. The doctrine is that, that you will have a glorified Christ in a flesh and blood world with a new gospel. I'm categorically saying this is not the case. Amen. That when Jesus comes again, we have in Scripture, there's too much, now there's too much said about this for this to be questioned. Uh -huh. There's just too much said about it. In the day comes as a thief of the night, the heavens and earth will pass away. It's too explicit now. There's no reason for anybody not to know this. Uh -huh. It says he's going to come. When he comes in his glory, he's going to destroy them that know not God and obey not the gospel. And he's going to do it when he comes to be admired in the saints and to be, and to be glorified in them that believe. It's too, it's too much. Too much said on this. Now, what we have now, now let me just conclude, conclude this. I'm glad I don't have, I'm not going to speak a lot of messages like this because it's in a sense, it's kind of a, kind of a downer because it's so, it seems like it's so obvious, but yet... People can clutter up your thinking on it. Uh -huh. Right now, today, in the day we're living in, when Christ is at the right hand of God, this is the day of salvation. It's not a day of salvation. It's the day of salvation. We receive an exhortation like this. Hebrews 3.13 Exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 says, This is the day of salvation. Behold, today is a day of salvation. It's the accepted time. Hebrews 4, 7. Now, my point in giving these is that this presumes that when the day that he's talking about ends, the means of salvation are terminated. All right. He doesn't say another means will be ushered in. <clears throat> Hebrews 4, 7. Again, he limits a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long a time, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Why? Because this day is going to end. And when it does, the grace to obey God is going to be withdrawn. Again, Jesus said this. John 12, 35. Yet a little while is a light with you. Walk while you have the light. Mm -hmm. Lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. So when, when this light of the glorious gospel is actually in the, in the sense of the power of God and the salvation is withdrawn, there will never be another person get in. Amen. That's it. Again, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Just nothing before the time. The time. Until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise from God. Now, isn't it Jesus going to come and illuminate some hearts and leave others to be changed by some other means? If one person's heart's illuminated, they're all going to be illuminated. Amen. And if one person gets praise from God, everybody who was faithful gets praise from God. Well, let's look at it from another point of view. Jesus in the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew 25, 10, he says, When they went out to buy, the bridegroom came. They that were ready went in. To him 
to the marriage, and the door was shut. That was it. There wasn't one more person got in after that. Mm -hmm. After all the fancy theology and all the arguments are presented, when Jesus comes again, we have it from his own mouth. The door will be shut. Mm -hmm. Now he elaborated on it. He said he's going to send the angels to gather them all in. And the door is shut. Therefore the means to get in is withdrawn. Once again, Luke 13, 25. When once the master of the house is risen up, that's to leave the, thr the throne. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us, he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence you are. Then he shall begin to say, We've eaten and drunk in thy presence, thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know not whence you are. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. When Jesus gets up the next time and he leaves the right hand of God, the intercession is over. Amen. The children will be gathered in. <clears throat> now in conclusion, Christ's coming will close the door. We will close the door. Those, those who are ready will be brought in. Those who are not will be punished. Mm -hmm. The heavens and earth will pass away, so the arena in which we were to work out our salvation and trembling, the arena itself will be dissolved. <laughs> so there won't be a place adapted for getting ready. Mm -hmm. All temporal things. It's done. Even death and hell will be cast in the lake of fire. Anything temporal, it's gone. And the Son of Man shall come in His glory, in the glory of His Father, and then, then, He'll reward every man according to His work. But there's no rewards going to be handed out before the conclusion. There isn't. Again, 2 Thessalonians 1.8, He's going to come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and obey the gospel who will be punished with everlasting destruction for the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power when, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. That's, that's when that's going to happen. So if anyone's going to be saved, <laughs> this is the time. Yeah. This is the day. It's, it seems relatively simple, doesn't it, to say it, but there's a lot of souls that are lingering around waiting. They've got their excuses. They will tell you, well, I don't feel like it's the right time, or here's some thing that's troubling me. This is why I'm not a Christian. Well, these are all lies. They don't want to be saved. Yeah. And the day they come to admit that, God will work with them with the gospel. But if they don't get this thing settled before Jesus comes, there's not a chance mm -hmm. that they can be saved. Because all of the means of salvation will be terminated. I trust that that uh, <laughs> wasn't too abrasive and that I made it clear. Yeah. But if you read the scripture with this in mind, it like stands out almost on every page. And God be praised that while, uh, while we have this brief interlude called time, that whatever it takes to come to Christ or to be saved or work out your salvation or to subdue the fleshly nature or put off the old man or put on the new man, whatever it takes to do that is supplied in his great salvation. But that will be terminated when Jesus comes.